Welcome to this rapid revision video looking at the pace of progress and factors for change across the medicine through time topic. Aside from the Medicine on the Western Front source investigation, this will be the last in this series and so aims to be a summary of the entire topic, looking at what changed, how it changed and how fast it changed. With that in mind, there's often going to be quite a lot of information on the screen. So if you are watching this in detail, you might want to pause it at various points to read more closely and you might want to view it full screen and in high definition to make sure it's as clear as it can possibly be. Let's get into it. Firstly, we need to consider the factors for change, which I've summarised with these images down the right hand side. You can probably guess at what one or two of them are. Change in progress in medicine can be caused by any number of factors. But here's some of the most important and the ones that we will focus on today. Individual genius, science and technology, war, religion, governments, chance and luck. We will review each major period that we have studied in this course and assess the rate of progress and the factors that brought this about. So let's start with our earliest period. We're going to plot our findings on a graph. The y-axis here shows the rate of progress. At the bottom we've got the medieval, which we can see as our starting point, and right at the top we've got the present. Not the end of progress, but just how far we've got so far. So by the end of this presentation we'll have got all the way up to the top of the scale. Along the x-axis we've got the main periods that we've been studying. The medieval, the renaissance, the industrial and the modern from 1900 onwards. And we will of course start with the earliest, which is the medieval. So let's consider our factors again. Where are these relevant to the medieval period and what progress do these bring? So what was the role of individual genius during the medieval period? Largely this is continuity. Hippocrates and Galen were the foundation of rational medical thinking at this time. But remember that their ideas were ancient even by medieval standards. Hippocrates being an ancient Greek and Galen being an ancient Roman. What about science and technology? Well, there was very little new progress using science and technology. The church restricted new ideas and thinking quite deliberately. Then we have war. Warfare was common in the Middle Ages, but it did little other than cause disease rather than accelerate medical developments. And then we have religion. This is the hugely significant one in this period. God was the biggest explanation for disease. Prayer was a major prevention and treatment and the church a massive influence on knowledge. This led to little progress, though. However, as the Middle Ages progressed, the church provided hospitals with a focus on care, not cure. So there was perhaps some improvement. Lastly, government or second to last, I should say, government uh, had some reactions to catastrophes such as the Black Death. And there were also some attempts to keep cities clean, but otherwise did very little. In terms of chance and luck, though, there are no relevant examples. So how much progress was there in the medieval period? Not a great deal. It's largely a period of continuity. But we can say that things have improved at least a little with things like hospitals and with the church at least providing and preserving ancient medical ideas. So that's covered the medieval period. Now let's move on to the Renaissance between 1500 and 1700. That's not exact, but it's a rough date range. What are our Renaissance factors for change? Firstly, individual genius. This one becomes a lot more important here. Firstly, we've got Vesalius with his knowledge of anatomy and his book Fabric of the Human Body. We've got Sydenham and his ideas on diagnosis, where one treats the disease underlying the symptoms rather than the, uh, treating the symptoms themselves. We've got William Harvey with his ideas on blood circulation and how many times Galen was proved wrong by all three of them. However, there's little progress in understanding the cause of disease at this time. Then we've got science and technology. Finally, some progress here too. The big one is the printing press. This made information more accessible and took it away from the control of the church. Human dissection became possible and experimentation, including the Royal Society, became possible too. Water pumps and other technologies were also inspiring. So water pumps in this case inspired Harvey's idea about circulation of the blood. And we have the introduction of microscopes, which become increasingly important. War is also important. New weapons such as guns produce new wounds. This advanced surgery. For example, Ambrose Parade's gunshot ointment and prosthetic limbs. What about religion? Well, this is still very significant, but the grip of the church on new ideas was starting to slip, especially with the start of the Reformation. People were turning more towards humanist ideas, 
and that the ideas for causing disease were not necessarily religious. Government is also important, but not as important as it is later on. There are more reactions to catastrophes, in this case the Black Death in 1665, and there are some attempts to keep cities clean and to combat miasma. Some support the new ideas, e.g. local magistrates helping Vesalius, and with Charles II supporting the Royal Society. We've also got chance and luck. There are only a few examples of this though. One might be Pare running out of oil and, dis and discovering his ointment instead. This shows that there was actually more progress in the Renaissance period than in the medieval. So you can see that our line has gone up at a faster rate than it had before. Now let's move on to the next period. Next up, we've got the period of the Industrial Revolution from roughly 1700 to 1900. So what are our industrial factors for change? There's a lot of significant individuals of this one here. Jenner with his smallpox vaccination, John Snow discovering that cholera was a waterborne disease, even if no one believed him at first, Edwin Chadwick with his influence on government policy, and Joseph Bazalgette's sewers, all of which had positive impacts for public health. Then we got Simpson's chloroform, one of the first effective anaesthetics. Lister and Liston, who both improved surgery. We've got Pasteur with his germ theory, which was a crucial and correct theory about the cause of disease and Robert Koch who developed them. Also Ehrlich and Hatter who developed Robert Koch's ideas and were in fact part of his team. They all worked on the cause of disease and treatments. And we've got Florence Nightingale who contributed to improvements in nursing. We've got science and technology too. There's increased experimentation by important individuals like those we've listed above. And there's also proof of germs causing disease. We have the development of vaccines, starting with smallpox, but extending to others, including rabies. We've got effective public health measures by the end of the 19th century, and development of anaesthetics and antiseptics in surgery, making it more advanced and a huge amount safer. War also has a role to play. The Crimean War allowed Nightingale to improve nursing. Pasteur and Koch were motivated in part by the war between Germany, or at least Prussia, and France in the end of the 19th century. Religion is less significant than previous times though. People are looking for scientific explanations for disease rather than simply praying. Government, as we've already touched upon, becomes increasingly important too, as society becomes more sophisticated and, comp and uh, complex. Governments were initially resistant to change, and this is known as laissez-faire or leave alone, do, no, do, do nothing politics. Later, there are increasing reforms. There's support for Vaseljet sewers, for example, which are paid for out of government coffers. Also, there's the passing of the Public Health Acts, both in 1848 and in 1875, with the first being voluntary and the second being compulsory. There's the Sanitary Act in 1866 and improvements to housings with the Artisans' Dwellings Act in 1876. We've also got some chance and luck, but only a very little. Possibly Simpson's discovery of chloroform, but let's not forget that he was actually looking for an anaesthetic, so it can't truly be all about chance. But look at our line. In my view, at least, this shows a rapid amount of progress, certainly much more than we've seen in either of our other two periods so far. On to our last period, the modern period from 1900 through to the present day. Our modern factors for change start with individual genius again. Loads of these again, Alexander Fleming, Florian Chain, who all helped develop penicillin, and Domac with sulfonamides. There are more too. Science and technology. This is a big one. Creation of new medicines, the search for magic bullets, mass production of penicillin and other medicines, new surgical techniques, discovery of DNA, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, x-rays, transplant surgery, MRI scans, CT scans, endoscopes, well, it's just about endless when you look at the science and technology contribution to the 20th century and beyond. War is also important. We've got the impact of World War One on things like x-rays, blood transfusions, surgeries and more. World War Two has a similar impact on surgery, but also helps ramp up penicillin production. Then during World War Two, there's the beverage report, which started off the welfare state and eventually established the NHS. Religion by this point has little impact although there is some controversy on, over new ideas based upon some religious ideas too. Government is really important at this time. 
There are the liberal reforms in the early part of the 20th century, with Lloyd George's People's Budget, budget, budget uh, providing school meals, old age pensions, the National Insurance Act of 1911, and more. There's increasing slum clearance, support for penicillin before and after the Second World War, the creation of the NHS in 1948, and also health and lifestyle awareness campaigns to try and keep people healthy. Those would be about prevention. Chance and luck is not that important, but we can include Fleming's discovery of penicillin. It's only by chance that a spore of penicillin mould landed in exactly the right place where it could make a difference and be seen. But it took the prepared mind of Fleming himself to recognise its importance. So our steepest and most progress um, line yet is this last one here. You can see that that brings us right up to the present day. What do you notice about the line? Well, what it should suggest to you is that progress is slow in the medieval period, a slightly faster line of progress in the Renaissance period, accelerating in the industrial period, and really very fast in the modern period. So as time goes on, and remember this is not a timeline that's really to scale, we can see that medical progress is accelerating. Let's hope for all of our sakes it continues to do that. Some final points then. Progress in medicine has not always been consistent. There have been significant periods of continuity and change. Continuity, especially during the, the medieval period and to a certain extent regarding health into the Renaissance period too. Sometimes there is progress in one area, e.g. the understanding of anatomy in the Renaissance, and little progress in others, e.g. the understanding of the cause of disease at the same time. Factors affecting change and progress include individual genius, such as Vesalius, Harvey, Pasteur and Fleming. Science and technology, such as the printing press. War, such as progress made during the world wars. Religion, such as church hospitals. Government, such as the public health acts and the creation of the NHS. And chance and luck, such as the discovery of penicillin. These factors can help and hinder or hold back progress. Overall, the trend of progress is one where progress is slow in the Middle Ages and more focused on continuity but it accelerates significantly in each subsequent era. And that sums up the end of the Medicine Through Time topic, aside from the source investigation, which I'll be dealing with in its own series. I hope that this series of videos has been helpful to you. If it has, please like this video, comment and like on the other ones, and also subscribe to the channel. If you've got desperate suggestions for a future topic for me to cover, then please put it in the comments below and I'll do what I can to help. But for now, I'll say thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you for engaging with this particular series of rapid revision videos. And I wish you all the best in your studies. But for now, I'll say goodbye and good health.